So welcome everyone. This evening we go boldly. I think I have to say this differently. We will boldly go where as a professor of classics and comparative literature I've never gone before, but as an administrator I go quite often. Black holes. <laughs> <laughs> Our speaker, Veronica Hubini, will shine what I can only imagine is a very, very powerful light on the subject. I'm honored to welcome you this evening to the first inaugural talk of the Winston Co. Frontiers of Mathematical and Physical Sciences Public Lecture Series. For those of you who are not familiar with Professor Co., and I can't imagine there are many of those, I can tell you that he is a legendary agent for change in our mathematical and physical sciences. Winston devoted his 41-year career at UC Davis as professor, chair, and dean to pushing new frontiers of discovery in everything from his own work on subatomic particles to better understanding the whole cosmos. Professor Coe led the building of our cosmology program from the ground up. Now it's one of the top-ranked programs of its kind in the country. UC Davis is grateful to Professor Coe and his wife Katie Coe and others who a few years ago so generously supported the establishment of the Winston Co. Faculty Fellowship in Science Leadership. This endowment supports UC Davis faculty who are national and international leaders in math and physical sciences. We also have the Co. family and other generous donors, other generous donors to thank for this public lecture series. Winston, Katie, would you please stand for a round of applause? This evening, we celebrate not only the first co-lecture, but also the first public lecture by a member of the newly formed Center for Quantum Mathematics and Physics, affectionately known as QMAP. The creation of this interdisciplinary research center is very exciting. It's interdepartmental bringing together mathematicians and theoretical physicists to explore some of the most confounding and mind-bending realities of the physical universe. The questions they explore are as fundamental as can be, addressing such issues as the origin of time and space and the fate of the universe. I'm especially proud of this new center because it shows that UC Davis can successfully transcend the boundaries and extend the disciplinary range of a single department, college, or school when the research venture calls for it. Our Office of the Provost envisaged such flourishing of new expertise a few years ago when it established what we call the Hiring Investment Program, or HIP. The program provides funding to hire stellar faculty in pursuit of progressive campus goals, such as cultivating an emerging field of research, strengthening a critical aspect of graduate education, or advancing diversity in our faculty. Thanks to this successful initiative, we have been able to assemble at the center a group of world-class researchers in quantum dynamics, one of the most exciting and provocative areas of inquiry in the field that is the envy of top physics researchers at Princeton, Caltech, and yes, even Berkeley. We're honored <laughs> to have one of those world-class researchers speaking to us this evening. Professor Veronica Hubini is an expert on quantum gravity and black holes. After earning her PhD in physics from UC Santa Barbara in 2001, she held a postdoctoral position at Stanford's Institute for Theoretical Physics and then a research position at UC Berkeley. She was on the faculty at Durham University in the United Kingdom before joining the physics department here at UC Davis as a core member of the new Center for Quantum Mathematics and Physics. Professor Hubini has made many groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of the emergence of space-time and the dynamics of black holes. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Hubini. Well, thank you very much. Well, let me start by welcoming all of you to this inaugural QMAP and Winston Co. public talk. It's a great pleasure and privilege to share with you some of the most amazing marvels of our universe. 
Well, since the dawn of humanity, people looked up in the sky and wondered what's out there. They pondered what are things made of, what led to it all, and so forth. Well, mankind has certainly made tremendous progress since then, but our curiosity is still as insatiable as ever, and our quest for understanding goes on. And the deeper we probe, the more fascinating nature turns out to be. In fact, I can't help thinking that even the wildest imaginings of science fiction can't compete with how elegantly bizarre nature actually is in real life. Well, so um, the understanding, the underlying structure of the physical world is the subject of physics. And fortuitously for us, it happens to be elegantly described in the beautiful language of mathematics. What's more, the common sense requirement that our mathematical description must be self-consistent is surprisingly powerful. So much so that even in the extreme realms of science, those far beyond the direct experience or experiments, we can still make definitive predictions. Now, perhaps the most bizarre uh, feature yet ubiquitous this one of our world, is its quantum nature. And this, in fact, underlies many of the profound questions in modern physics. So here in da Davis, a new center for quantum mathematics and physics has just been set up in order to deep, deeper, uh, delve deeper into this unknown. And we seek to understand the fundamental principles governing our universe. In particular, we want to understand and answer questions such as, what is the underlying nature of space and time itself? How did our universe get started in the first place? And what will be its ultimate fate? What are the sort of deepest manifestations, most striking manifestations, of the quantum nature of our world, especially on macroscopic scales? What are the mathematical structures that govern our world? Uh, and what new surprises do they reveal? Well, there are hundreds of others, and I guess each one of us has their own special favorites that you know, keep us up at night. Now, you might think that, well, these are fairly broad, and it's, you know, how, how do we even get started on something like this? But we are making good headway, and I think that we'll finally be able to answer at least some of these within our life lifetime, perhaps even very soon. Well, one reason to be optimistic is that these questions turn out to be curiously intertwined, as are indeed many diverse concepts in physics. And it is this interconnectedness that's perhaps the most remarkable feature of our world. And the topic of today's talk illustrates this better than anything else I can think of. So today, I want to tell you about my favorite objects in physics, namely black holes. Uh, well, most of you have probably heard a lot about black holes, especially in recent months. Uh, and you probably even recognize them as pretty spectacular objects out there in our universe. What's less widely appreciated is that black holes are also tremendously powerful theoretical constructs, which underlie the deep relations between disparate areas of physics. And you know, most people find them mind-boggling, but black holes actually turn out to describe uh, much more mundane systems that were used to from almost everyday life. So it's this multifaceted nature of black holes that I want to give you some sense of today. Well, I should probably start by explaining what black holes are. And well, if you ask someone, you can get many different answers. Perhaps the simplest answer uh, that, well, the regions which you can never see from outside doesn't convey much to you yet. The more colloquial answer that there are regions where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape its pull uh, is 
perhaps easier to visualize, though probably for the wrong reason. But, but you know what? Let me not shelter you from stretching your imagination. That's what you're here for. And so I'll try to illuminate how I think about black holes. But in order to do that, I need to tell you how we think about our concept of space and time. Well, according to the Aristotelian view, uh, we were, space and time were absolute, and we were at the very center of the universe with all the heavenly bodies orbiting around us. Now, this view started changing uh, in the Renaissance, where when Nicolas Copernicus um, proposed a model with the sun at the center, with the Earth orbiting around it. That led to the first scientific revolution, and uh, eventually to the Copernican principle, which says that our position in the universe is nothing special and other places look pretty much like um, they do here. Now, Galileo Galilei bravely championed Copernicus's view and furthermore dispensed with the notion of absolute rest. So the laws of physics are the same uh, for observers, no matter how fast they're moving. So you probably know from you know, personal experience, for example, if you fall asleep before your plane takes off and you wake up mid-flight, but for the external indicators like the hum of the plane engine, you would not be able to tell that you're now moving hundreds of miles per hour faster. In fact, we don't even particularly notice right now that the Earth is whizzing around the sun at a briskly 67,000 miles per hour. Now, so far, uh, forces were deemed to act instantaneously across space, and this view was upheld by another key figure in the scientific re revolution, Sir Isaac Newton, who noticed that, well, gravity affects all objects alike. So for example, the Earth orbits around the sun not be but because it's pulled by a force, by a gravitational force generated by the sun's mass, just as apples on Earth fall under the pull of Earth's gravity. But this notion of simultaneity started shifting in the, uh, in the late 1900s, uh, sorry, 1800s, when uh, James Clerk Maxwell noticed that electricity and magnetism were actually two sides of the same coin. And disturbances in one can give rise to the other. So for example, if you have an oscillating electric field that creates a magnetic field, which in turn creates an electric field and so forth, so you get a self-sustaining wave. Maxwell calculated that this wave propagates at an astounding 186,000 miles per second and recognize this as nothing but our good old light. So we learned that the carrier of the electromagnetic force, the photon, which you can uh, think of a, as a quantum of, of light, propagates at this finite speed. And here is where we start getting to the interesting stuff, the so-called second scientific revolution. Um, well, Michelson and Morley had calculated that, had observed that the speed of light is the same no matter which direction we look in, and so it's quite independent of Earth's velocity. So in 1905, Albert Einstein realized that in order for the speed of light to be the same for everyone, no matter how fast they are moving, the notion neither space nor time can be absolute. This space and time join into a single concept, so-called space-time. Now the new theory called special relativity uh, was quite groundbreaking and marked a major turnover and is still used today, especially in situations like particle physics where gravity is not important, but the particles are moving very fast. But Einstein wasn't done. There was still gravity to account for and Newton's law certainly did not fit into the new framework. So it took Einstein another 10 years uh, to come up with a relativistic theory of gravity, 
but the result was one of the most spectacular achievements of mankind. Uh, the new theory called general relativity posits that space-time can actually get warped by presence of matter or energy, and it is this warpage which manifests itself as gravity. So let me tell you a bit more about general relativity since this is the context where I can finally uh, start talking about black holes. So Einstein's key idea was that since gravity affects all objects alike, we should identify it with another universal quantity, the curvature of space-time. You can think of this in a two-dimensional analogy of a rubber sheet. If there is nothing on the sheet, it is flat, but if you put some heavy object, it makes a dimple, and the more compact the object, the larger the dimple. Now, if you roll a small marble on the sheet, it's not going to look like uh, it's going in a straight line anymore. It's still trying to follow the straightest possible path, but the sheet itself is curved, and so it gives rise to this uh, bending. Now, the same thing happens to space-time, except that in the case of space-time, it's both space and time that, that get warped. So to summarize, the space-time tells matter how to curve, and matter instill, uh, sorry, how to move, and matter in turn tells space-time how to curve. So unlike all the previous paradigms where space-time was just a passive arena on which all the action took place, here space-time is the star actor. So unlike Newton's picture, the Earth goes around the Sun not because it's pulled by any force, but because it's trying to follow the straightest possible trajectory in the curved space-time produced by the Sun's mass. Now, Earth itself curves space-time around it, and so we, along with apples and everything else, follow the straightest possible path when we're in free fall. But this is not just a, uh, you know, different description, same physics in a fancier language. It actually corrects Newton's gravity where it would have gone wrong, and it predicts new effects. Now, in daily human experience, most of these effects are pretty negligible, although precision instruments uh, can be sensitive enough to, to the effects of general relativity. So, for example, the global positioning system, you know, your GPS units in your cell phones, without general relativity effects, would get you quickly off route with the error accumulating by about 20 feet per minute. Um, all right, so, um, so we have this picture of general relativity, but in the cosmos, the effects of general relativity are much more striking. So here is a picture of a starry sky, ordinary starry sky just like our own, but in the foreground, there are two objects which bend, deflect the light from the distant stars. In fact, they happen to be black holes, and in this picture, they do look like sort of holes to the starry field, but that's misleading. They're not holes in the background starry field. They're rather warpage of the foreground. So you can see this better when I run the movie. All right, so you can see that the, the black holes orbit around each other, and so the warpage changes in time. It's like having a moving lens in front of the background. Now you can also see here another prediction of general relativity that's new, namely waves, ripples in the space-time propagating outward. Just like Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism predicts electromagnetic waves, Einstein's theory of gravity predicts gravitational waves, and these carry away uh, energy, and so the black holes, as you just saw, spiral into each other and uh, merge. Okay. So now that you have seen the effects of black holes, let me tell you a bit more about what they are. So the more compact an object, the larger the effect on the space-time curvature. And in the extreme case, we can get so much curvature that 
all communication from the region is effectively cut off. And uh, that is the black hole. So in nature, you know, this might seem very extraordinary, but in nature, this actually occurs all the time, typically at the end point of a so-called gravitational collapse. So to see what's happening, it's is nice to sort of visualize this on a so-called space-time diagram. So I have drawn here as time running upward, and space runs horizontally, except that, well, I have suppressed one of the spatial dimensions because it's hard to fit a four-dimensional space-time you know, on a two-dimensional screen. So if you're an observer who stays at the origin of space, you would follow this trajectory of just the vertical line. If you have some event, like a flash of light, that would be a point on the space-time diagram, but as the light propagates outward, everywhere in all directions, you get this light cone. So at some time later, if you take a snapshot of this wave front, you get a sphere that's centered at you know, the position where the flash of light took place. Now, of course, we don't want to really consider real flashes of light all over the place, but these light cones are very useful as hypothetical objects for telling us what is possible physically, where is it possible for a you know, particle or any physical object to go, its trajectory must always stay within the local light cone. Now, if you have a collapsing star, at early times, it's a ball like this, and as time goes on, it gets smaller and smaller, so the full evolution looks like this. So here the star implodes to a point, but uh, I'll come back to that later, but the rest of the space-time, what happens is very nicely described by these light cones. You can see that far away from the star, the light cones look like they would without the, pretty much without the star at all, because they're not very sensitive to what's happening uh, out here. But as you get closer, you see the light cones start tilting, and at some point, the sides become vertical. And at that point, it's no longer possible for any physical trajectory, including light, to get back out. And that is the event that is the black hole, and its surface is called the event horizon. So if you were an observer who falls into the black hole, as you would cross this horizon, you wouldn't see anything special happening to you. You would just merrily go on your way, but at this point you would have doomed yourself on a path of no return, and if you, you know, try to call your friends or put on your emergency light beacon, your friends would never get the light that you sent. It wouldn't encounter any barrier, it would simply fall in with you. And no matter what you did subsequently, you would be irrevocably drawn to this central region I have indicated by this red line. Now that's called the curvature singularity. Here, space-time becomes infinitely curved, and general relativity loses its predictive power. So, in that sense, it sort of predicts its own downfall, but that's great because we know that there is more to come in our fundamental description of the universe. All right, so, uh, of course, now in, I should say that, uh, you know, this. This, this idea might have seemed outlandish to you, and in fact it bothered Einstein 100 years ago. Uh, and you know, even though Carl Schwarzschild wrote down the first black hole solution only a few months after Einstein wrote his paper, it wasn't for 50 years that people actually started taking the solution seriously. Initially it was just an esoteric thing and almost an embarrassment to the otherwise beautiful theory. And it wasn't until the well, late 60s that John Wheeler actually coined the phrase black hole, and only by the 70s people started learning all sorts of stuff about black holes and uh, in what now is thought of as the golden era of black hole research. And, uh, it was catalyzed by sort of the astrophysical observations catching up, and astrophysicists recognizing that black holes are actually physical objects out there in the universe. So how do they come to be? Well, they, they are typically a result of uh, this gravitational collapse of a star. 
So this is an artist's conception of what's happening to the star. So initially, nuclear fusion converts all the lighter elements into the heavier ones till the most stable phase is formed. And if the star is heavy enough to start with, then the outward pressure no longer sustains the star against its own gravity, and the star collapses in the process releasing its enormous gravitational potential energy in a supernova. Now, if the core is only a, you know, a few times as massive as the star, then this object will settle down to a neutron star, which is the densest known regular astronomical object in the, that we know in the universe. So its size would be scarcely larger than the city of Davis, but the density is so high that uh, half a cup of it would weigh as much as a mile long by mile wide by mile tall slab of lead. Now that was the mild scenario. If the core was heavier, then this, it would undergo further gravitational collapse and irrevocably form a black hole. Now, it's no longer sensible to talk about density because the entire star has imploded into the singularity. But just to give you a sense, if the entire Earth collapsed into a black hole, its size would be only about this big. So um, in the process of this collapse, for lots of further energy can be released in a form of gamma ray burst, which in the few moments, if it were converted to light, all that energy, that would unchain the whole rest of the, uh, well, it would produce as much uh, power as the sun does in its entire lifetime. All right, um, so you see that black holes are sort of responsible for some of the most energetic processes that we see in our universe, which is good because otherwise it would be very hard to observe them since no light can, of course, escape from a black hole. But objects in the vicinity of black holes get affected so much that we see the telltale signs of the black hole's presence. So for example, the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, uh, Sagittarius A star, was first ascertained by observing sort of stars, stellar orbits around the center. More dramatically, if a star gets sufficiently close to a comparable sized black hole, it literally gets ripped apart. Uh, more typically, as sort of matter falls onto the black hole and spirals in, it gets heated up by friction, and we can then observe this characteristic radiation. And pretty soon we'll have a new telescope, the so-called black hole telescope, that will be actually able to resolve the angular size of a, of a black hole. And now on top of all that, we have entered the exciting era of the gravitational wave detection. So I think it's quite fitting that the first direct detection of gravitational waves happened almost precisely 100 years after Einstein formulated general relativity by uh, LIGO last September. And it, you know, this was no easy task because the sensitivity that's required uh, for realistic processes to measure the gravitational waves in our vicinity is like measuring the width of the human hair in the distance to Proxima Centauri, our nearest star. So it's a tremendous uh, you know, uh, achievement and uh, uh, you know, sign of human ingenuity that we were able to do it at all. So from the signal that LIGO measures, you can then, by comparing with predictions of general relativity, you can then read off a lot about the event that took place. In this case, more than a billion years ago. So you can read off you know, what kinds of objects produced the gravitational waves, how heavy they were, and so forth. All right. So. Through all these observations, we now learn, well, we get some estimates of how many black holes there are in the universe. So already in our own galaxy, in the Milky Way, there are 100 million uh, 
approximately uh, black holes, which, are, which have mass slightly larger than the sun. And so if you add up all the galaxies, the entire universe has some 100 quadrillion, that's one with 17 zeros after it, or 10 to the 17 such black holes, which is like the, well, greater than the number of grains of sand in the entire Sahara Desert. Now, in fact, each galaxy also has a humongous, supermassive black hole at its core, which has ma mass of several billion uh, times the mass of the sun, and the size larger than our entire solar system. And in fact, there's a black hole produced somewhere in our universe every second. So by the time I finish the talk, there will be thousands more. <laughs> so, but, but you know, the universe is so vast that you don't have to worry about being swallowed up by a black hole just yet. Yeah, the, the nearest observed black hole is in the Sagittarius arm of our galaxy, some comfortable 1,600 light years uh, from Earth. So now I have to, told you uh, a little bit about black holes, but what I consider to be sort of the least significant aspect of black holes. My main purpose was to sort of allow you to get some intuition and uh, to also give you a sense for how extreme objects black holes are as, as physical objects. So you're probably well positioned now to realize how preposterous it would be uh, to suggest that black holes could have any bearing on you know, everyday systems that we can observe here on Earth. And yet, it's precisely what we have been learning in the last 10 years. And so to explain that, I now have to tell you a little bit more about the mathematical description of black holes. Well, so Einstein's equation um, tells which, which is the hallmark of general relativity, tells us how the curvature of space-time is related to matter distribution. And black holes actually are the simplest and most, one of the simplest and most studied solutions to this equation. In fact, we learned that black holes can exist even without any matter um, at all. So, Subramanian and Chandrasekhar called black holes the most perfect macroscopic objects that there are in the universe because the only constructs uh, that we need for them are our notion of space-time. In fact, you know, you might find it curious that given how extreme an object black hole is as a physical object, why is the mathematical description so simple? But I, in fact, think that the two go hand in hand. Um, so why is it, well, how do we, why do we assert that the solution is simple? Well, let's think for a moment what it would take to describe, say, a star that's about to form a black hole. Well, you would at least need to include all the stuff that falls into the star and all the information that that carries. So that's a very complicated description. However, once it collapses to a black hole, the final state is very simple. It's just characterized by three numbers corresponding to its mass, angular momentum, and charge. John Wheeler characterized this as, by the memorable phrase, black holes have no hair. So uh, now, what is the use of that? Well, from the pragmatic standpoint, it's great because it allows us to study the properties of black holes uh, explicitly. And we find many surprises. Okay, so one of the surprises is that black holes actually behave in some respects like ordinary, much more like ordinary systems than one might have thought. So to explain that, I should tell you how do we characterize black holes. So the three most important characteristics are the black hole's mass, which I already mentioned before, the surface area of the event horizon, and a weird sounding quantity called surface gravity, which you can roughly think of as the force needed to hold a unit mass suspended just at the horizon if you're holding it off from infinity. 
All right, so those are three main quantities. And let's now compare how would you characterize some ordinary uh, system like fluid or gas or some material. Well, if you don't want to bother with all the microscopic details of the individual particles, you can work in terms of some coarse grained quantities. And the important ones are the temperature, the energy, and the entropy. So out of these, probably the least familiar one is the entropy. But even that made it into popular culture. So you can think of entropy, roughly speaking, as characterizing the amount of disorder in the system. So in this cartoon, if the kid didn't have so many things, then there wouldn't be such a big disorder. So you can equivalently think of entropy as sort of telling you about how many distinct possible states the system can be in. And in fact, you can also think of this as the amount of information that can be stored in the system. Now, energy, you're probably much more comfortable with, for when we talk about it all the time these days. And roughly speaking, you can think of it as sort of the, uh, how much work can be uh, uh, produced by the uh, system. The temperature is probably the most intuitive for, for all of us. Um, and but in many sort of familiar systems, like Earth's oceans here, the temperature would, can vary from place to place. But that's because the Earth's oceans are not in equilibrium. They're getting heated differently in different parts, and they have different sort of external effects that are changing uh, with time. For systems in equilibrium, things become much simpler, as described by the laws of thermodynamics. So the temperature, according to the zero law of thermodynamics, is the same throughout a system in equilibrium. The first law tells us how energy changes uh, compared to how entropy changes, and this is related by the temperature. And the second law of thermodynamics tells us that entropy must always increase. Now, these laws were already known in the 1800s and are uh, key to the um, subjects of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Now, in the 1970s, people discovered that the laws of black hole mechanics actually mimic the laws of thermodynamics. If you replace the thermodynamical quantities by corresponding quantities pertaining to black holes. So if you look at this, you see that you can identify black hole mass with the energy, the black hole area with the entropy, and the black hole surface gravity with the temperature. Now, at this point, you might think that this is just a cute analogy built on rather tenuous circumstantial evidence. And in fact, that is what people initially thought. But more and more people started realizing that it's far more than just an analogy. So, Using thought experiments, Jacob Bekenstein realized that black hole entropy must indeed be proportional to the horizon area in order to uphold the second law of thermodynamics in nature. And famously, Hawking then calculated that black hole actually radiates at a temperature that's indeed given by its uh, surface gravity with a precise relation. So we learned that black holes really are thermodynamical objects. Now, let me come to this entropy black hole area relation uh, in a bit more detail. And well, I know that one is not supposed to present equations in public talks. Uh, but you know, this equation is so, so nice and important that I couldn't resist. So I hope it doesn't scare you off. So first of all, what is an equation? Okay. If I asked you to come up with an example of one, uh, many of you might come up with something like, say, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. The equal sign means that there's an equivalence between what's on the left-hand side and what's on the right-hand side, but possibly uh, one side is more convenient to use than the other. Now, the equations that we use in physics uh, have a deeper meaning in that they tell a story. And the story that this equation tells is particularly intriguing. So usually, if we have an equivalence, well, 
it might be relating to seemingly disparate quantities. And the fact that it's an equation, there's an equal sign, means that these quantities are actually equivalent. Okay, so in this case, the equation tells us that black hole entropy is actually equivalent to the horizon area, which is you know, astonishing to say the least. Now, what about these other quantities? Well, apart from the number four, which you can all recognize, all these other things are just fundamental constants of nature, which effectively set the scale. In fact, most often physicists just work in units such that all of these are equal to one so that you minimize the clutter in the equations. But their presence here tells us an important hint. It tells us what parts of physics are necessary to understand the meaning of this equation in a uh, deeper way. So in particular, it, well, we, we, it turns out that you need almost all aspects of physics. So you certainly need statistical mechanics, you need relativity, you need gravity, and you need quantum mechanics. Okay, so apart from this, so it tells us that the equation is actually very deep, and to understand it, we need a theory that sort of unifies all of these. Now, apart from the connection between these subjects, what is the actual surprise here? Well, if you calculate how much uh, the entropy is for, say, a solar mass black hole, you get an enormous number, something like 10 to the 77. That's one with 77 zeros after it. And in fact, in statistical mechanics, the entropy is related to the number of distinct microstates, states in which the black hole can be, in, by an exponential relations. The number of microstates is exponential of the entropy. So in this case, it would be, well, I can't write it on a slide because the number would, is so large that even to render it would be more than you know, the number of atoms in the whole universe. It would be one followed by this humongously large 10 to the 77 number of zeros after it. So where are all these black hole microstates? According to general relativity, black holes have no hair, and so we need to look further. We need to have a theory or framework which unifies all of these to tell us where the microstates are. Now, string theory is one of the most beautiful candidates that sort of contains all of these, and unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you anything about string theory, but it indeed does manage to reproduce the number of microstates precisely that agrees with this formula um, at, in, in some controlled context. So whatever the final theory that describes our universe uh, happens to be, it must at the least be such that it upholds this equation. All right, so accounting for number of or identifying the black hole microstates wasn't the only puzzle in town. Perhaps the more pressing one is the so-called black hole information paradox, which points to a striking clash between what general relativity tells us and what quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanics tells us. So according to general relativity, anything that falls into a black hole is lost forever, including the information that it carries. Now, as Hawking calculated subsequently, the black hole radiates, but the radiation doesn't carry away any information, and eventually it leaves the black hole to evaporate completely, so at the end of the day, all the information is lost. On the other hand, according to quantum mechanics, that can't happen. Quantum mechanics has an inherent time reversibility, so even if the information gets scrambled, you can just run time backwards and recover what, what the information there was. So there should be some process where we can get all the original stuff that fell into the black hole. So you can see that this process of black hole formation and evaporation clashes with the laws of quantum mechanics at some fundamental level. Now you might think that this would be a embarrassment to us, 
but in fact, it's a wonderful opportunity because it points to a precise place where these two cherished theories clash with each other. And so no, we know where to look in order to make them uh, consistent. All right, so let me now come back to uh, what we already do know um, and what's a consequence of the entropy to area relation, all right, which is something called the holographic principle. Okay, so let me ask the question of how much information could you maximally store in a given region? Some box, let's say. Let's say we take it each edge being foot long. And how much information could we pack in? Equivalently, how much entropy would fit in that box? Well, suppose we take the box and we pack it with, say, very informative books. And we ask, what happens if we now have more such boxes? Well, one box would have a volume of one square foot, one cubic foot, surface area of six square feet, because it has six sides, and let's call the net amount of information that it has S. Okay. Two such boxes would then have twice the volume and presumably fit twice as much information, but the surface area is only 10 square feet because this intermediate side isn't facing out anymore. Three boxes would have three times as much information and three times as much volume. And four boxes would have four times, eight boxes would have eight times, and so forth. So this little exercise would lead us to conclude that the amount of information scales with the volume. Okay, and this is indeed true when the effects of gravity are negligible. But when gravity comes into play, this is no longer the case. In fact, eventually, no matter how little you put in a box, eventually if you take sufficient number of these boxes, they will gravitationally collapse into a black hole. And we just learned that black hole has an entropy that's only proportional to the surface area, not the volume. Okay, so the information now scales only with the surface area. And moreover, the black holes are the most entropic objects that fit into a spherical region like this. If you try to pack in any more information, the black hole will just grow. All right, so uh, this observation leads to the so-called holographic principle that we can, in effect, describe everything in the box just by using information that fits on its surface, not the entire volume. Now, you might say, well, what's, why is it any different than, for example, watching movies? Right? You see a two-dimensional screen, and it's supposed to portray a three-dimensional world. But in movies, you don't see what's lurking behind the foreground objects, and you don't see inside closed boxes. Here, the assertion is that we can describe everything. So there will be some two-dimensional theory that lives on the surface of the box that actually knows everything that happens inside that box. And, well, unfortunately, the holographic principle doesn't tell us what form this theory should take. But fortunately, we have a concrete example, the gauge gravity duality. But before I tell you what's gauge gravity duality, let me just tell you what is, what do we mean by duality as such. Okay, so it's the statement that the same physical reality can have several different distinct descriptions that are so-called dual of each other. So to illustrate the idea, let me use this convenient Escher drawing. So here, you know, you could be describing things in terms of this fish, which get worse and worse as you go up, or in terms of these birds. Uh, and like many physical dualities, these objects in terms of you, which you try to describe what's going on, are well behaved in some corner and get sort of worse and worse, cease to be sort of good description as you go away from that corner. 
In physical dualities, this is typically the strength with which you know, these objects, fundamental objects, interact with each other. Now, it's not just these fundamental objects that change from one side of the duality to another. In fact, most properties look very different, much more than, than would be suggested by this picture. OK, so let's now come back to our gauge gravity duality. It's a wonderful example of a holographic correspondence. This is also known as the ADS-CFT correspondence. And it was first derived within string theory by Juan Maldacena about almost 20 years ago. But we now understand that this applies in much broader context. So this gauge gravity duality asserts that string theory, which among others is a theory of gravity, is exactly equivalent, describes the same physics, as a gauge theory. This is a quantum field theory without gravity that has the special property that uh, it looks the same on different scales. So it's so-called conformal field theory, or CFT. Okay, so that was a lot of words. But uh, the important point here is that the two theories live in different number of dimensions. The string theory lives in what I'll call a bulk um, in an a space-time, which is called anti-de Sitter, abbreviated as ADS. This is a, sort of a space-time which is negatively curved, like an analog of a hyperboloid. The gauge theory lives on the boundary of that space, so one lower dimension, just like our surface of the box. So in the early days, people like to visualize it in terms of a soup can. So the string theory is uh, the soup inside, while the gauge theory is just a label on the boundary of the soup can. But unlike an ordinary soup can, where the label just tells you, roughly speaking, what's inside, here, the label is everything. All right, so because the two descriptions live in different number of dimensions, we call this correspondence holographic because it upholds the holographic principle. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with real holograms. Um, in fact, I think a much better analogy would have been a stereogram, like this 2D image, where if you look at it in a certain way, you see a three-dimensional image sort of coming out at you. It's a, well, in this case, it's, it's due to the uh, correlations between the different splotches that your eyes interpret as parallax. In other words, each of your eyes in this, is in slightly different position, so it sees a slightly different image, and your brain then interprets this very cleverly to you know, get the distance information. Of course, it can be fooled by these types of images. So in the ADS-CFT, or this gauge gravity correspondence, the idea is infinitely more complicated. There you would have you know, correlations between everything, and the image that you would see would look like a sensible lower dimensional image that, however, does give rise to a completely different higher dimensional picture, the gravity side. All right, so we see here that the space-time gets completely scrambled be between the two sides, but it's not random, it's in fact very delicate in such a way that everything works out you know, just right on, on, on both sides of the correspondence. So perhaps the first question that anyone might ask about such a holographic correspondence is, well, whatever happened to this extra dimension that now the lower dimensional theory doesn't have? In this case, what would happen, what happened to this, this radial direction? Well, Fortunately, part of the answer is already suggested by the geometry of this anti-de Sitter space-time, okay, which you can think of spatial geometry, which is like looking on top of this, on the lid of this soup can. It's very nicely described by another Escher drawing, this one, where uh, 
the size of each of these fish is supposed to be the same in the actual space time. And so you would need to traverse infinitely many of these fish before you get to the, the boundary, which is just here. And moreover, any of these vertices is just as good as any other one. So there's a symmetry in the space time where there is no real origin. You can think of any of these equivalently. And so the mapping to the boundary has to respect the symmetry. So a given point here has to be encoded by something such that if we, well, some region on the boundary, such that if we shift this, that has to shift consistently. And so we learn that, in fact, this radial bulk direction, how close you are to the boundary, must have to do with the scale or the size of the corresponding object in the field theory side on the boundary. All right, so for example, points near the boundary would be described by small arcs. Points further in would be described by larger arcs. In fact, I quite like this picture for another reason, which is that it also very nicely uh, tells us that, well, there are many different ways you can describe the same bulk point. For example, you could have taken this arc or any of the other ones. And in fact, that observation has been used recently to relate this mapping between the bulk and the boundary, recast it in terms of something that quantum information theorists would call quantum error correction. Now, this type of relation also gives us a very useful intuition of what we would expect to happen on the, in the two theories, on the two sides. So for example, if you have some object in the bulk that falls, well, if you let go of an object here, it feels the gravity of this entire city space and it will fall in. On the boundary, that same physical process is described by something that's initially localized and spreads out as time goes on. It's sort of like if you put a drop of ink in a cup of water, you'll see it spreading out. So that's, that's, that's sort of uh, mocked up by the, on the both, uh, both sides. All right, so I've told you just a tiny aspect of uh, the gauge gravity duality, but what is it good for? In fact, it's great for loads of things. So since uh, Maldosina's original paper, there have been well over 10,000 research papers citing his original work, and it's still very much ongoing today. So remember that the duality relates to theories, a theory of gravity living in higher dimensions to a non-gravitational quantum field theory living in lower dimensions. So in the left-hand side, the systems that we want to consider are things that feel the gravity, like black holes. In fact, black holes are the most prominent objects in this, uh, on this site, in this entire city space-time. Now, unlike our own expanding universe, the cosmology of the space-time is different, but everything that I have told you about black holes still applies here. Now, what about the right-hand side? Well, the right-hand side describes much more familiar systems that we're all used to. Basically, every sort of strongly interacting uh, type of systems that's uh, described by strongly interacting field theory. So a large class of these, if you sort of look at some course level, behaves like a fluid. And so, uh, but this would be a fluid that lives on the boundary of this entire DC space time. And the flow of this fluid, all the various vortices you can have and changes in temperature and everything like that, is mimicked by what the black hole is doing, by the behavior of the horizon. And this allows us to study even the sort of hitherto uh, mysterious uh, questions such as turbulence, trying to understand turbulence. Or, you know, in condensed matter physics, there's still plenty of materials which we don't really understand, like high temperature superconductors. And often it happens that the best bet 
for understanding these systems is to study the dual black hole. And so nowadays you find many physicists uh, studying black holes, even those who are not uh, working in general relativity for this reason. The systems are also experimentally accessible, and the black hole describes things ranging as widely as cold atoms, which are some uh, micro Kelvin temperatures, to the hot quark gluon plasma produced in colliders, which is in trillions of Kelvin, so spanning almost 20 orders of magnitude, still described by the same type of black hole. All right, so this gauge gravity duality has been an invaluable tool both for studying this strongly interacting field theory systems, which is hard because it's strongly interacting, but describes many systems that we're familiar with and want to understand deeper, by working on the, in a higher dimensional gravity in ADS, but convert, which is much easier. But conversely, we can also study quantum gravity in ADS, which is very hard, but of course needed to understand the fundamental uh, nature of space-time and so forth, by using the field theory, which for some uh, respects is much easier. Right, so, um, well, black holes have, of course, formed a crucial ingredient in deriving the, this gauge gravity duality and figured at many stages, but black holes also reappeared within the duality. So we can study black holes in ADS by these other systems. And so you might ask, okay, so what are the lessons that we learn about black holes from this duality? And well, I already told you that, well, we have seen black holes as quite extreme objects in some regards. Now we learn that they saturate loads of different bounds. And so we already saw that they're sort of the most perfect macroscopic objects in terms of their simple description. They also happen to be jewels that come the closest to a perfect fluid, to ideal fluid. They happen to be most efficient in storing information. They also happen to be the fastest in equilibrating things. You know, for example, if you have a planet that has a, some mountain, it takes ages to decay. If you have a black hole and you deform the horizon, that decays faster than anything else could possibly decay. It's also fastest to scramble information. And from a quantum information theoretic respect, it also happens to be sort of fastest, act like a fastest computer. Now, what are the lessons that we're learning from all this new insight about black holes? Well, an important one is sort of hints about the nature of space-time itself. And through this correspondence, there have been very tantalizing hints that the space-time itself, well, is, is certainly not a fundamental concept. Just like a fluid, for example, is not going to be a continuum down to arbitrarily small scales. At some point, you start seeing the particles. Well, so too, we now believe that space-time has some underlying quantum structure. And the hints that we have been getting is that Quantum information theory, and especially quantum concepts like entanglement, play a crucial role here. So we don't yet know how space-time, what, what is space-time at some fundamental level, but we have had many tantalizing hints that it sort of comes from this um, entanglement. Ah, I'm over time, so <laughs> let me end uh, by saying, well, we have had, um, we have seen many different guises of, of black holes. And it's amusing to know, you know, to think historically how they rose in prominence over the last century, starting with almost being an embarrassment to general relativity, to being some esoteric objects that nobody understood, to finally being uh, important astrophysical objects that actually we observe in our universe to being mathematically beautiful 
constructs that we could then use to, for example, uh, construct uh, these profound dualities that relate many different aspects of physics to finally being related to, you know, almost ubiquitous, being related to, you know, everyday ordinary systems. But, so that has been quite an impressive climb, but we're nowhere near the summit yet, and the best is still to come. So I think that black holes will really be a, hold a key to quantum gravity, the theory that should uh, be a self-consistent framework that captures both general relativity and quantum mechanics. And uh, while well, we have had all these hints, and uh, um, so far we have, I think, there's so many different connections that we're seeing that I think we have barely seen the tip of the iceberg so far. There's so much more yet to uncover and to understand and to explore. And in fact, I think that, you know, in the whole last century of general relativity, these revelations about black holes have brought us to what I think is the best era to be a theoretical physicist exploring the mysteries of the universe. And the best is yet to come. So, thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for a really lovely talk. So what we have now is we have about 15 minutes to take questions from the audience. And then um, afterwards, we'll, we'll, we can stay back for some informal questions at the very end. But, um, we have, so wait for a microphone, and then we can take questions. Can, since black holes can contain so many particles and so much information, can it help us explain uh, dark matter and dark energy? Well, I would certainly hope so, but <laughs> I have no concrete uh, um, um, idea as to how that would do that. There are many observations and many theories of dark matter and dark energy. Well, especially, you know, we have observed dark matter and there's many models that sort of relate that. Um, uh, so their black holes will probably figure a little bit less. For dark energy, I think that's much more promising. So it's a humongous puzzle. If we sort of imagine from uh, arguments within particle physics, how much the natural sort of energy we should have for the, this, the sort of our universe, or the background in our universe, the vacuum, it comes out 120 orders of magnitude off by what we actually measure. So it's one of the biggest problems in physics. Now, people think that the resolution to this, well, okay, some people hope that the resolution to this might be some secret interplay between things that are very, very small and things that are very, very large. Something, some, some known locality, some new element in our physical description. And a very similar type of thing is needed for, for example, resolving this black hole information paradox. So black holes, once we, I think, this black hole information paradox is such a deep question that I think understanding it will finally lead to basically a new, a third scientific revolution, completely new paradigm. And I think that once we understand that, we will certainly understand uh, dark energy as well. A question on, on this side. If black holes um, kind of swallow every all the energy and light around them and nothing can escape, does that mean eventually the whole universe will be swallowed in a giant black, black hole and nothing can escape? Well, not necessarily. So it happens that our universe is actually expanding. It's expanding faster and faster. So even if we have black holes locally, 
in our galaxy, let's say, they will swallow up things that are around them. But in the meantime, the surrounding space-time will expand so much that they won't have time to swallow you know, everything. It's still true that you know, when the universe expands so much uh, that there won't be much left. You, know, that you might not have things like uh, stars and galaxies and so forth, but it won't all be inside a black hole. Other questions? Over here. Uh, you mentioned uh, black holes without matter, which is kind of intriguing. So uh -huh. would this happen when entropy is very low and consequently the event horizon is very small or something different? Oh, they can be any size. They can be completely any size. Um, so it's just that, so this equation, Einstein's equation that relates the curvature of space-time to matter distribution happens to be a type of equation that it has multiple solutions. So even, so one solution if you have no matter is just flat space-time, but another solution is, uh, is a black hole. In fact, you can sort of think of the space-time itself as doing the gravitating. It starts getting curved, and that sort of gravitates and gravitates more and sort of makes up a black hole. So it has nothing to do with size. The size, the black hole can have any size even without having any matter. Now in you know, our universe, uh, that doesn't happen in the sense that typically black holes just collapse uh, from something, from a star, in which case there was some matter to create it. But as theoretical constructs, or mathematical constructs, typically people study them you know, without bothering with all the you know, details of what collapsed, because effectively, you see, the essence of a black hole, as we saw in the black hole thermodynamics, is the horizon, which is kind of curious that you know, nothing is actually happening at the horizon. You know, there will be just empty space. But nevertheless, the black holes act like some physical objects that where the horizon is very important. And for that, it doesn't really matter whether the black hole formed from some star that's now squeezed into the singularity or just is an object without any matter. Can the holographic approach help us to understand entanglement? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. So in fact, that has been a growing area in the recent uh, decade or so, or slightly less, and it's a, it's a very fascinating um, development. So entanglement for, for everyone else is sort of the most quintessential uh, aspect of quantum mechanics. It's the most non-classical manifestation of quantum mechanics present when, uh, you know, if you know everything about a total system, still doesn't mean that you know everything about its individual parts. It's what Einstein called as giving rise to spooking action at a distance. And, but nowadays people think of it more as a quantum resource for tasks that can't be performed by classical resources, like quantum teleportation or things like that. Now, in this gauge gravity duality, you can ask, what is entanglement, well, a measure of entanglement, something called entanglement entropy, of some, uh, say, region on the boundary? And within the field theory, it's a very complicated object. It's an important one, but it's very hard to calculate and measure because it's so sensitive to the, to the environment. And so you might think after all this mapping between the Balkan boundary that scrambled things so much that on the gravity side, in the bulk, this will be vastly more complicated because we use some very non-local scrambling map to go between the two sides. Miraculously, it turns out to be extremely simple. In fact, it this entanglement entropy turns out to be given just by an area of some surface. The surface in, in, in this bulk it's like a soap bubble. It's a special type of surface that minimizes its area. 
and this entanglement entropy is given just by this area. So it's some, basically the simplest geometrical object that you can come up with on the gravity side in the bulk is actually characterizing this entanglement entropy. And so there is something deep behind that. There is some relation where the space-time, which tells us where this minimal area surface is, actually knows or arises from entanglement. And in fact, one of these mysterious pictures sorry, <laughs> um, that I had in sort of creating space-time that looked like this whatever, spaghetti monster <laughs> is a picture of uh, a, a sort of conception of something that people called well, entanglement builds bridges, or ER is equal to EPR. Okay, those are the letters that stand for people. It's Einstein Rosen and Einstein Podolsky Rosen. Einstein Rosen refers to a, a, a wormhole, a, a throat of a black hole. So if you remember your embedding diagrams, they sort of, sorry, your, your, this rubber sheet, it got deformed. A black hole could be so deformed that it would actually come out on the other side. That object, this, this, this wormhole, is the ER side. The EPR side, einstein porosky rosen refers to this entanglement. And so the picture is that somehow, if you have entanglement between many different things, the fact of this entanglement actually creates space-time, creates this wormhole. Okay, so this is very new and people have yet to understand it at some deep level, but it's very exciting because it's a Okay, another question, maybe on this side. Or do, we have, do we have another question? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, was it? Was, I, I'd like to ask you a, a question about the mass of a black hole. And I don't even know if it's experimentally uh, uh, or observationally possible to think of it in this way, but uh, are people able to measure how much mass is going into a black hole? And if so, does it turn out that the observed mass of the black hole, is it the sum of all of the masses going into it, or is it something else? Okay, it's something, well, already we can answer that from the mathematical description. It's not quite just the rest, what the masses would be if those objects were at rest. It's all the sort of energy that goes in. So kinetic energy that's caused by not only the rest mass of the object, but also the fact that it's moving. That's the thing that gives rise to the black hole's mass, but by how much the black hole actually increases its mass. Now, whether it's observed, so you can certainly detect black hole mass by looking at how things orbit it. So for example, in the case of the Sagittarius A star, the planetary, or the, sorry, <laughs> the stellar orbits around it nailed down precisely how massive it is and how big it is. And from that, people concluded that it has to be more compact than even a new, you know, anything that we know of. And therefore, it has to be a black hole. But in practice, there's the amount of stuff that's falling onto the black hole is typically very small fraction of the black hole mass to start with. So you, you would have to keep observing that object, say an accreting black hole, for a sufficiently long time to actually see any change. But that, theoretically, it's certainly possible. And I think it will be more and more possible with this new uh, new telescopes, the black hole telescope coming online and so forth. So experimentally, we live in very exciting era too. So I actually just noticed the time, and I'm gonna wrap up the official question section, and you can come up and take, there'll be a few more, time for a few more questions informally with Veronica, but let's thank Veronica again for a fantastic talk. Thank you.